moderating this session. So uh, I'm very happy to be here at the launch of what I think is a crucial uh, new work. It's called Women Break the Silence, Gender-Based Torture in Asia. And we will be putting up on the, sorry, excuse me one minute. <laughs> Excuse me, this is office and so people are coming in. Excuse me. Um, we uh, are delighted, as I said, the uh, Women Break the Silence, Gender-Based Torture in Asia. And you can see the link uh, in the chat. So please do download the report. Um, this is by the World Organization Against Torture, OMCT. And I really think uh, it's also to me a great honor to be moderating uh, this illustrious panel. And we have, that includes three of the authors. It includes the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Its Causes and Consequences, an internationally renowned human rights and women's rights lawyer, and a torture survivor and activist herself. So what is new is really breaking the silence around gender-based torture, because we have for decades, as all of you know, been breaking the silence against violence against women, gender-based violence against women and girls, but it seems without getting the sort of traction that we were hoping for. And despite the decades of concerted efforts that have been made, in spite of all of that, the pernicious patterns and practices of gender-based violence against women and girls has not only persisted, but they've taken on new shapes and adapted to the environment and sidestepped the remedies and preventative measures that have been adopted. And so it's really distressing and absolutely unacceptable that despite world recognition of the issue, despite international human rights standards, despite domestic laws and innumerable initiatives uh, to prevent and redress the multifaceted aspects of gender-based violence against women. The ground reality is in the world. Every third woman on this planet is a survivor of gender-based violence. Um, and violence, unfortunately, is extremely pronounced in Asia. And that is the focus of the book, uh, at the report in our session today. And I have absolutely no doubt that the outcry would be far louder and that the actions would be far more robust if it was torture or violence against any other group of people. So whether it was based on race, on ethnic or religious identity or other identities, um, there would not be this apathy towards what's happening. And this is something I actually wrote about in terms of discrimination generally in my report as the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights when advocating for cultural rights for women on a basis of equality with men. And the root cause, as we all know, is the patriarchal imbalances of power that undergird all of our structures and systems, regardless of how different they may appear on the surface, at the base of all of these is a patriarchal system. And that is kept in place by cultural systems of belief. And that they can be religious, but they can be non-religious, but they are all one and all they are patriarchal. So using the concept of torture to bring home the deep-seated lifelong trauma and devastation of gender-based violence to me is vital um, because the cognitive and emotive responses when you talk about torture are far stronger than if you talk about beatings, if you talk about domestic violence, even sexual assault does not have the same con uh, cognitive uh, impression as torture. And this report, therefore, is an opportunity to further explore how the anti-torture framework can give us uh, a tool for protecting and providing redress to women survivors of gender-based torture. So ensuring that gender-based violence against women and girls is seen as torture can leverage the special stigma that's attached to torture as a deliberate ill treatment causing severe pain and suffering. The anti-torture framework also provides a holistic approach which requires preventative measures through relevant laws, public uh, awareness raising, legal safeguards for the survivors, 
training of relevant actors, which includes the police, the prosecutors, the judges, and the military, and comprehensive reparative concepts which entail restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-recurrence. The UN Committee on Torture, and we'd be happy to know, has started to integrate a gender perspective in its concluding com uh, 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 comments and observations some two decades ago. And it specified the due diligence standard, which means the state's obligation to exercise due diligence to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and punish non-state officials or private actors under the convention. And so the report looks at how you can advance the application of an anti-torture framework to violence against women. And so eight women human rights defenders from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Mongolia, Nepal, India, Philippines, and Sri Lanka have analyzed the prevalence and patterns of gender-based forms of violence against women, the circumstances under which these uh, take place and the consequences of torture and women's access to reparation and rehabilitation. So there are eight chapters in the book and they're also recommended actions. So I would really, uh, encourage everyone to download the report so we can take it further. I don't want to take up any more time given our eminent speakers. And so without further ado, let's start with Farishta Hakimi, who is an amazing young woman, human rights defender from Afghanistan, who is currently in exile in Europe and who works with the Civil Society and Human Rights Network in Afghanistan on its violence against women and minority programs. Farishta previously worked for UNICEF on its women in health uh, programs, uh, girls' health program, and taught human rights for girls in schools. So having studied medicine and business administration in Afghanistan, Farishta is currently a fellow at the Madre uh, organization, which I'm sure many of you know, and is studying for a degree in entrepreneurship. So Farishta has faced multiple forms of violence by private individuals, as well as the Taliban, without receiving any form of redress. So Farishta, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Farida, for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, looking at my childhood, I see a little girl who grieved over the dead body of her father with no dreams or future. When my father was killed by the Taliban, our fight for survival became more difficult every day. As a family of three women and a child, uh, in, a, in a conservative society of Afghanistan, where usually men are breadwinners and protectors of, the, of their family, we were left with no hope. Fortunately, I was lucky enough to be able to attend school where I could immerse myself in math problems, trying to forget my own problems. However, a corrupt, incapable government ruled over the country with a Pandora jar in their hands, re release, re releasing evil upon people. Despite facing threats, situation, threatening situation, we continued living. In 10th grade, I started working to support my family. Having a difficult childhood, I felt no pressure um, pursuing two bachelor degrees and working at the same time because I had to. However, it comes with a surprise that when my colleagues found out that there were no men in our, in our family, they asked me to marry them and went so far as threatening me when I denied. The psychological pressure was very high and we lived with uh, fear all the time. My mother decided to get me married to avoid those threats. She engaged me to a person I had no information about. This made things even worse. I, as I later found out that he was a drug addict and also married to another woman. He was from a powerful family and his father had a high position in military. He abused me physically and verbally. I tried to separate from him and complain to the government, but failed in vain. I distinctly remember that when I complained to the government authorities, the man said that he could not help me and even if he tried, he would put him and my family both in danger. My fiance's father hit me with, with his car the same day I complained to show to uh, the same day I complained to the government to show me that they are watching me and they can be treated to me and my family. I tried to escape to another country, but with coronavirus situation and having the responsibility of all members of my family, I could not succeed. 
The final, they finally silenced me with the kidnapping my with kidnap with the attempts to kidnap my sister and warned me of the conse consequences uh, if of any attempts to get separated. I started working with Civil Society and Human Rights Network in 2019, having faced injustice and violence my entire life. C. Sharin seemed the right place for me to work. After the release of some of my interviews, my fian my fiance's family and my other relatives warned me not to appear in the media again, so I started working behind the scenes. I received a scholarship from the University of North Nar Texas, but could not leave my family behind because they were alone. Therefore, I put all my effort into helping women and minorities with their problems. I tolerated all the injustices just to protect my family from starvation. The corrupt government emptied their jar of evil the, when they failed the fight with Taliban. Every little window of hope was shut and a nightmare upon people. Although some people were evacuated, the majority of people remain inside the country. I am just lucky to be talking from here. Thousands of girls are screaming for their rights and nobody can hear them. I'm here for the to be the voice of the voiceless. My story is one of the hundreds and thousands of stories of Afghan women and girls. Many women and girls are dealing with some sort of torture and violence as at the moment as we speak. Well, on the bright side, I truly believe that Afghans are very, very resilient. Speaking with many Afghan women and girls who have suffered violence and injustice and yet still continued living with, with courage, gave me hope. I, can, I have come to conclusion that with minimum support, Afghan women can make a huge difference. I have devoted my life to support them. I urge the international community and all you dear uh, people uh, who, are who are listening to me, not to take a single step back regarding women's rights in Afghanistan. Please help Afghan women to go to school. Please help Afghan women to have a big dreams. Please help Afghan women to have a job and the result will astonish you, I promise you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fiste. Let me first say, I think we all express our deep appreciation of what you're saying and our deep sympathy uh, for the women of Afghanistan. They are our sisters and we will try whatever we can um, to support them. So yes, it's a very hard struggle, but as you said, Afghan women are very resilient. You've put up with so much for so many decades and your generation, I have to say, is a different generation from the, my generation who were more scared, you're much more active, you have education and you're able to go forward. So good luck to you and we will be there with you. So I think uh, what the, the expression of no hope and yet you are resilient, the fact of, no, uh, of not having uh, uh, punishments, so the impunity and the silencing. And I think with the silencing, what you've said also is not just the, the survivor, but it's anyone who tries to help her is brought in and brought under threat. And so that isolates you even further and it's very difficult. So I'm going to turn now to the special rapporteur on um, because we're looking at what can be done. So we're going to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Reem Salam, who is with us. As I said, the special rapporteur on violence against women, its causes and consequences. And she's been in that mandate since July, 2021. She's an independent consultant on gender issues, rights of refugees and migrants, transitional justice and humanitarian response. Reem has extensive experience as being a consultant for the UN system, uh, for the departments, agencies and programs, including, for instance, UN Women, OHCHR, UNICEF, and IOM, as well as for civil society organizations, think tanks, and academia. She's been an international civil servant and served with the UNHCHR, which is the, the refugee um, uh, organization in 13 countries, planning, implementing, and monitoring programs to protect survivors of gender-based violence, particularly women and girls. Her, she has a master's in international relations from the American University in Cairo and a master's in human rights law from the University of Oxford, UK. And so Reem, your mandate, the mandate is one of the older mandates uh, in the UN special procedures. And it's looked at gender-based violence, 
against women from very many different perspectives. There's the varied forms of violence, the impact it has, the legal remedies that are possible, and now from the torture perspective. So can we ask you to explain a little, what is the relationship between gender-based violence and torture? How do you bring the two concepts together? Yes, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me uh, to this illustrious panel and uh, also uh, to having uh, survivors of violence with us today, uh, because I think this is very important that they also get to speak uh, in their own voice uh, about this experience. Um, so yeah, we know that the freedom uh, from torture is not only uh, part of uh, the Convention Against Torture, but is also customary law. And um, uh, the, the CAT committee recognized in, in general recommendation two that both men and women and boys and girls may be subject to violations of the convention also on the basis of their actual or perceived non-conformity with socially determined gender roles. And as you also stated, um, gender-based violence is actually a, a form of violence that uh, is perpetrated against uh, men, boys, women, girls that don't conform uh, to uh, gender assigned roles uh, that have been defined uh, by uh, patriarchal uh, norms of society based on unequal uh, power uh, relations. Uh, and gender-based violence can take uh, multiple forms and shape. Uh, we, we know it's not only physical, it can be psychological and sexual, and it can also be acts, uh, actual acts or threat of violence. And uh, in this respect, you know, integrating a gender perspective on torture and ill treatment is critical to ensuring that violations uh, rooted in discriminatory social norms around gender and sexuality are fully recognized as a special rapporteur on uh, torture said. So it is also therefore recognized that uh, certain expressions or forms of GBV can rise to the level of torture. I think we find a non-exhaustive list of that in general recommendation 35, uh, which states, for example, that violations of women's sexual and reproductive health rights such as forced sterilization, forced abortion, denial or delay of safe abortion or post-abortion care, forced continuation of pregnancy, abuse and mistreatment of women and girls seeking sexual and reproductive health, uh, information, goods, services are forms of gender-based violence that depending on the circumstances may amount to torture or may amount also to cruel, inhuman or uh, degrading treatment. And so the mandate has in, in different uh, ways and opportunities actually spoken on this issue. Uh, lately, uh, actually since I took on my mandate, we've spoken very much about how the denial of, for example, women's right to abortion can amount to torture within the context of the Supreme Supreme Court decision on Texas, and now also this last um, uh, draft uh, that was a decision that was leaked from the Supreme Court. Uh, of course, female genital mutilation is, is also inherently cruel, inhuman, or degrading trafficking, which affects women disproportionately. Uh, we've also uh, often referred to the fact that women in detention and prisons can also experience heightened exposure to rape that can amount uh, to torture and other forms of sexual violence. Uh, but I also would like to caution that, of course, um, GBV is not only physical, uh, the psychological forms of violence can also amount to torture. And of course, the consequences of different forms of GBV as torture can manifest itself in uh, serious psychological uh, and mental uh, consequences. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, the recognition of GBV as a form of torture is important because it makes vis survivors visible. And secondly, because it also raises the, the state obligations towards survivors, including the obligation to redress. And the state obligation is invoked here, not only when it's um, uh, committed by state officials, but also if it's, for example, domestic violence and the state um, is uh, unwilling or unable to protect uh, the victim slash survivor against it. Thank you. Sorry, I muted myself. Thank you so much, Jim. I think there, it is important, as you said, to underline that it is psychological as well as physical, and that the Convention Against Torture talks about cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And I think all of those elements are almost inevitably uh, 
part of gender-based violence against women, girls, and others. Um, so I think that's something uh, that's important. Also non-conformity uh, to what the society says is the main uh, gender role that you are assigned at birth or soon thereafter. And if you try and deviate from that and from the rules, um, that's when the violence sets in if you are not uh, conforming and you're not giving in to what is given. Um, so one of the issues that we have here is that the whole economic marketplace is somewhere where for many societies still, when women go into the marketplace, it is considered slightly outside their gender uh, role. And therefore, you also have a lot of gender-based violence going on uh, in workplaces, which uh, women then are very afraid to speak about uh, for various reasons. And so we have Sophie Jack, who is the di executive director of the Cambodian uh, Center for Human Rights, and that works to promote and protect political and civil rights in Cambodia. And she's one of the most prominent human rights advocates in her country. And her work has been recognized by many people, including the former US President Barack Obama. She's a recipient of the Indian Asian ASEAN Youth Award and the Franco-German Prize for Human Rights and the Rule of Law. And she was shortlisted for the 2019 Women in the Future Award for Southeast Asia. She has a master's degree in international peace studies from the International University of Japan. And she also writes a blog, which I'm sure we'll be happy to put in the uh, chat box. So in, in Asia, uh, so uh, violence against women at the workplace is quite rampant across the, the continent. Um, but women don't dare to speak out, they're, they're silenced. And so the consequences of not speaking out are problematic. The consequences of speaking out can also bring their own risks. So could you elaborate on what are the, the root causes of this and what do you see in the work that you've done? So, Yip, yes. over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Farida, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone uh, from Cambodia. Um, today is a very special occasion that we come together and, you know, like uh, talking about gender-based violence, and it is uh, to break the silence somehow. Um, as you mentioned, um, the gender-based violence against women happen uh, across the world. All those um, international community have tried hard to address it, but still the pre uh, prevalence of the case are still on right. And the pandemic, um, COVID-19 pandemic, just uh, make things more vulnerable um, and disadvantage for women and girls, and also LGBTQ. Um, in Cambodia, there have been cases that, um, you know, when it comes to the violent, gender-based violence happening at workplace, um, uh, it was reported, um, uh, you know, based on the tes testimony uh, of the women, um, many are not willing to proceed um, the case. And um, this happening, um, um, you know, like can um, uh, uh, happening because of the uh, 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 particular uh, attitude um, that that dominate in the society, but also, you know, it 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 combined with other factor like the um, big, uh, big legal framework, the, I mean, referring to the national legal framework, um, there have been certain issues with the definition of sexual harassment that have not been well described in the labor law, or, you know, when it comes to the gender-based violence, it will pursue more as a, um, you know, violent happening within the family line, not, not, not somewhat um, at the workplace. So the, the weak national legal framework um, uh, is, is one of the factors. But secondly, um, is the lack of um, complaint mechanism. Um, uh, at the workplace, you know, many workplace uh, don't have the uh, proper complaint mechanism, and especially the independent uh, complaint mechanism. And if we're talking about the case happening um, at the garment factory, for example, um, with the absence of the independent um, complaint mechanism, it's, 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 it's very hard for women to um, proceed with the case. And it also combined with, with the, the, the fact that, you know, many uh, garment industry 
uh, practice the fixed term um, fixed term contract um, uh, mainly is a short term contract so um, this these are the barrier for women you know to 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 dare to challenge the the status quo because a number of gender based violence happening um, you know within the uh, supervisor or you know like um, with 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 the male um, uh, dominant um, uh, superior so um, it is it is very hard for women to confront this and the other factor is the lack of investigation and legal action there have been cases when you know all those um, uh, it, it takes year you know until the women for example it 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 happening um in uh, police uh force uh police force so uh, that case you know happening for year and oh, and it take women the courage to come out and um uh, put the complaint um uh, you know to the ministry of interior on the um, sexual harass um, not not sexual harassment but it was a sexual assault um so it was silent until the complaint were put on social media and it went viral. That led to the investigation. However, even with the initial investigation and the ministry conclude that, um, you know, it did happen, but the case was whole. Like um, they don't proceed with the judicial um, process. They only uh, uh, ended with the administrative sanction, meaning the men have been, um, uh, remove from the position uh, to to lower level uh, in his his reign, um, and that's it. And and the official uh, from the ministry explained that the case could not proceed to the court because the women have been already embarrassing too much, and putting the case to court would put her even more embarrassing. So that you know the the lack of investigation and legal action causing to a uh, rampant of the impunity um again uh, the case of uh, gender based violence against women the other factor is the um um the lack uh, the underrepresentation uh, of the women leadership in the trade union or in law enforcement and judiciary um very few number um uh, when we talking about trade union sector in Cambodia, you know, many women are in the labor force. Um, it was reported that around 80% in the garment industry are women. But if we look at the leadership level, not many women are the trade union leader. So this is also a, a barrier for women, you know, to have no representation or when the mostly the male are the the, the trade leader uh, hardly that the case have been um, listened to so um and and when it comes to the law law enforcement you know when the women would would be uh, reporting to the police um there there have been um, you know sexist comment or the victim blaming back to the women so that interfered the women from um, proceeding to the to the case and even in the uh, judiciary um, there have been low low number of uh, women are uh, sitting as the judge or pro prosecutor uh, the fifth uh, factor is the uh, limited access um, to legal aid and essential service to support the um the, the survivor so all those you know many of us including the government recognize the need to address the gender-based violence they have been uh, not enough effort to address on the access to justice, including the legal aid, as well as the uh, rehabilitation or you know remedy support for the for for the gender based survivor. So um, a lot of time uh, women are left behind, um, you know, in the judicial system, but also when they need, for example, the mental health support or social support, it it very limited, and mainly it was operated by. Um, the civil society organization rather than the government. Um, final uh, final factor uh, to to me, I believe it resulting from again, you know, the patri uh, patriarchy and the victim blaming uh, culture. Uh, a lot of case when the victim have been uh, you know reporting um, their case of violence or they would um, stand out, um, you know, to to put the complaint on board. Um, many times um, the the victim would 
be dub, uh, would be double victimized, meaning that um, you know the public would would finger point not to the perpetrator, but the finger point back to the, the, the women who are the victim that, oh, you know, because um, she wear the revealing clothes or because she were uh, walking in the dark or, you know, it, it is late night why she were alone, for example, like that. So this, this is um, really problematic. And I would uh, cite one example, the, the case happening uh, last year during the pandemic as well, of one, one woman, uh, uh, female police, she was, um, you know, on duty and she, she tried to feed her baby and she, she shoot the, the photo and, and she posted it and by commenting that, you know, even she works uh, on duty, she can uh, forgot her, her baby. She, she had the duty to feed her baby too. That's it. And then her, her supervisor, her male supervisor have forced her to delete the photo um, from the Facebook and had to do a, a apology, you know, uh, having a letter uh, apologize for her behavior. And this, this, <laughs> this have caused a public outcry because, you know, like she had done nothing wrong by having, um, uh, fitting her baby orders on duty. And, um, you know, by posting, post, posting such picture does not require a permission from her supervisor too. And um, that result to, you know, the Ministry of Women Affairs come in and condemn, condemn the supervisor action. But at the end of, of the ministry statement, um, they wrote that, you know, all those, the women should not fit the baby in public. <laughs> so again, you know, the, the, the mystery statement is problematic because it, it, it kind of try to justify that the women behavior and baby fitting is wrong in, you know, so that, that inform us a lot of culture norm that affect the women um, uh, well-being, but also when, when there have been case um, happening again, women, um, uh, the women are victimized uh, further uh, beyond the act that she have been receiving, but uh, from the public to blame her for her behavior. So yeah, and, um, these are the root cause that um, um, we, um, we observe that um, have resulting to a continuing of the gender-based violence against women in Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I think you brought together many of the different dimensions that prevent women from accessing uh, any kind of remedy, uh, and even uh, breaking the silence, because you have your family to contend with, and then wherever you're working, you also have to contend with that atmosphere, then you have to contend with the legal system, and throughout all of this, the patriarchal norms and values uh, keep emerging one after the other, uh, to prevent um, uh, actions that would be appropriate for the survivor and support her. Um, and as you're saying, uh, feeding babies in public, that's hardly something that anyone, that is what women and mothers, not women, mothers do at a particular point in their lives and that's part of the natural system. Um, so the fact that they are workers, I'm just going to move now to Christina uh, Sevilla who is a human rights lawyer and a published author with 20 years of experience in prosecuting expertise, experience in the Philippine uh, criminal justice system. Because I think what, what we have just heard is that women have not just one identity, they have multiple identities. Um, so if we can try and unpack that, I think Christina would be able to help us do that. And she has uh, worked on cases which concern uh, human trafficking, gender-based violence, and defending the rights of children who find themselves in conflict with the law. And currently she's the Regional Human Rights Officer for Asia at the OMCT. And previously she worked and consulted with numerous other civil society organizations, including the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates, the United Against Torture Coalition of the Philippines, Vital Voices, Women Lead Foundation, and the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women Asia Pacific. Um, she's a 2009 fellow of the U.S. State Department's International Visitors Leadership Program, Combating Trafficking in Presence, and she holds a Master of Law degree with specialization in criminal justice and criminology from the University of New South Wales, Australia. So in your uh, uh, report, 
on trafficking and sexual exploitation of women, uh, Christina, you talked about the intersectionalities, the multiple simultaneous identities. Um, and so how does that really work in practice, both in terms of prosecution, but also in terms of what it means to the women uh, when it intersects, when your gender intersects with, for example, poverty or other identities, uh, group identities that you're given? Thank you, Farida, and good afternoon, everyone from the Philippines. First of all, I would like to say that um, this report, particularly the chapter on trafficking in person, is survivor informed. And I would like to thank uh, Mylene and Lisa, really, for trusting me with their stories. And hopefully, I do justice to um, what the horrific um, crime that they've been through by making sure, at the very least, that our policies whether it be at the national or at the regional level, are survivor informed. And so when we say um, trafficking in persons, obviously we all know that this is a very complex social problem. And, um, and, and if we look at it only from the lens of a law and order approach, it will not really counter or totally eliminate trafficking. And in the Philippines particularly, I guess I, could, I can actually say that I can say that um, in, in most countries all over the world, most victims really of human trafficking are women. And if you look at the Philippines, the statistics would show that um, most victims are women and that the purpose is sexual exploitation. And with this statistics would actually make us, uh, should make us really ask the question, why women? Why are most victims women? And um, again, in, in, in the Philippines, we see um, feminization of poverty. Um, we see that um, at least in 2016, in a study by UN Women, 40%, or only 40% of women are in paid employment. And it factors in, for example, the mess, not just domestic trafficking, but also cross-border trafficking where we see feminization in labor migration. Uh, we see many women, uh, vulnerable, economically marginalized women going out of the country and to seek uh, better employment or even employment. And, and they have to, have to abide by strict uh, border policies. And thus this makes them, uh, this make them even more vulnerable in the sense that they go through the underground system. And we see in the, in the cases that we've handled where border police, um, if it's cross-border trafficking, um, border police would be involved in, in facilitating their exit out of the country. And so, um, I, I, but I have to emphasize, of course, that um, Poverty, yes, indeed, it is a major factor in trafficking in person, but we have, of course, uh, the recognition that uh, being a complex um, social problem in itself, there are so many various factors. Although in most, um, if we look at, again, the statistics, it would really show that um, how women are, are marginalized due to, to, due to their economic condition. And thus, um, to, to view, um, to, to, to counter trafficking, we need to see, we need to understand how it intersects with other social issues and not just focus, for example, on prosecution and on holding, for example, um, the, uh, 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 in going after um, the, the traffickers, because that would basically be just we will just be producing a sort of a revolving door where you see victims go through them and then they come back and be trafficked again. And so when we, when we talk of intersectionality, we need to really consider an intersectional approach when we deal with trafficking in persons. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I think you've pointed out the, the problems of intersectionality and the revolving door syndrome, which I think is very important because you keep coming back. And that is some, a pattern that you find not just in trafficking, of course, I'm with a, a women's shelter here 
And we see the same thing in shelters as well. We see it in different forms as it comes back. You hope that it's resolved, but it's not. And the issue, because you're not really resolving the basis and the roots of what is there. And I think that's what you're uh, talking indeed. about. Hmm? Yes, indeed, Farida. And, and yeah. you know, so we see women, we see girls going through this revolving door and um, becoming re-trafficked. But then again, the moment they do access, for example, uh, the justice system, we then again see that they, the gender dimension where there is stereotypes. There yeah. are victim stereotypes that uh, are actually related to gender stereotypes. So most victims do not conform with what people, society would consider as the ideal victim. And so there is re-traumatization re as well. And that's, yeah. Um, it is, um, it is complex in that sense that we need to have that holistic approach, really, a holistic lens to, to address uh, trafficking in person. I agree. We've just completed research here on the barriers to women accessing government uh, services. And you find that the majority of it really goes back to your very basic patriarchal, cultural, uh, family, community, which prevents the woman from going forward. Um, and so with that, I want to come to when there is a system that's disrupted, uh, whether it's disrupted by the pandemic, whether it is disrupted by the, a natural disaster like floods or tsunamis, um, whether it is man-made with wars and conflict, you find the same patterns of everything getting worse. So the gender norms and the violence increases tenfold. So for that, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Sheen uh, abdul Saru to come in. She was from Sri Lanka, and uh, she's the co-founder of Manad Women's uh, Development Federation and Women's Action Network, which is a collective of nine women's rights group in Sri Lanka who advocate through doing research and documentation uh, and promote women's engagement in law reforms and access to justice through legal aid. They also provide shelter, livelihood assistance, and they raise consciousness. She's an Ashoka Fellow and in 2017 was the recipient of the Franco-German Human Rights and Rule of Law Prize and the UN and Peace Award. Her publications, because she writes, includes Our Struggles and Our Stories, which is a collection of research papers she edited on the war and post-war movement, women's movement in Sri Lanka, in the north and east of Sri Lanka, where there was a, a lot of conflict. Her latest publication is a collection of issues uh, of essays that looks at the issue of anti-Muslim sentiments in the post-war Sri Lanka. So, Sheen, if we turn to you, we know that we've seen Ebola and now we've seen COVID-19. We know gender-based violence and discrimination is enhanced. We also know that when you have natural disasters and Sri Lanka, like Pakistan, has gone through its fair share of conflict um, and of disasters. So if you can talk about how has this impacted women's reproductive health rights, for instance, because that is one of the first things that happens. But also generally, we found here, for instance, girls are being married off at a younger age as soon as you have any kind uh, of disaster that happens. Um, there's other uh, um, issues also for sexual and reproductive health, including sexual work, sexual favors for relief, et cetera, et cetera, goes on. So, um, Shirin, over to you. Please share your, your experiences. Thank you very much, Farida. Uh, a big question, uh, but three minutes. I, I'll try to see what I can do. Thank you very much for this effort. It's a great effort because always the women's issues have been couched uh, wherever, in our countries or international arena, always, uh, you know, a special repertoire on violence against women or child rights issues and all. So, like, it's good that we have broad base. Uh, the, the violence against women as torture and very particularly the torture happens uh, in, in, the, in the place that we all have to feel safe, that is home, uh, mostly by, by our parents, our, our intimate partners and all these things are now being uh, talked about very openly as uh, torture and I'm, I'm very happy for this effort. Uh, in this chapter also I have looked at 
uh, sexual reproductive health in a very much broad base is not only access to contraception or um, you know like uh, sterilization and then harassment that women undergo while delivering birth uh, and all those things also female genital mutilation very interestingly international community has said Sri Lanka does not have female genital mutilation we do have I'm one of the victim almost all the Muslim women at the yeah, in 40 days they undergo this uh, FGM it's a uh, you know milder version of uh, female genital mutilation it's a clipping or cutting of the genitalia and also um it also looks at uh, laws particularly in sri lanka legally that uh, women are made to feel secondary uh, we have a law that uh, that ban of not only ban abortion but also criminalize uh, any form of miscarriages and anybody who is volunteering can be sent for three years imprisonment including the doctor including the person who accompany this person and access to contraception, even in the context of rape, is very, very difficult in Sri Lanka. And the law that I'm going to talk about, a Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, which, uh, ha which has no minimum age of marriage. Sri Lanka is the only country where for Muslim women, there is zero age. Uh, uh, and and, and a, 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 even newborn baby can be married off with the permission of Kazi. Uh, and, and it's very unique because it's seen as multicultural society. Therefore, we have to tolerate all this diversity and all those things. But in that context, Muslim women suffer acutely and nobody wants to fix this system including the national mechanism that is where the child protection authority and human rights mechanisms nothing uh, wants to touch this issue and also it plays into sri lankan prolonged conflict and also the racism uh, the majoritarian context, the war and all those things, because right now, anything to do with minority community reforming uh, very uh, archaic law or discriminatory practices are seen as anti-Muslim in this context. Also, Tamil women, if you take the plantation, women who are um, uh, brought from India by colon uh, colonizers, uh, when you look at the sexual reproductive uh, issues, they have forced sterilization uh, because they want to make sure that they, they, they maintain small families and also there is indirect way of, uh, uh, you know, having uh, this kind of a control over that particular community. So community to community, it varies. Uh, women in marginalized minority communities are most oppressed and also in the context of uh, law, uh, impunity enjoyed by perpetrators. It is very difficult to hold perpetrators accountable, uh, leave alone whether it's military or other powerful bodies, but even your own family in that context, because the system does not work for us, uh, because it's very patriarchal, culturally, socially, and all those things. And then pandemic induced that, and right now we have economic crisis in Sri Lanka, because the regular system, particularly the system created by women's groups, the protective shelter provisions and also like assistant legal aid uh, counseling everything collapses in the system and then the current uh, government does not even recognize that crisis uh, need to look at first uh, certain unique issues that our women mm -hmm. and children are um, faced with and, and, and it can it can uh, you know double or triple in the context of uh, crisis i'll stop at that and i'll answer the question thank you very much Thank you, Sue, for your very passionate uh, intervention. I think we're all passionate about this issue, and I'm really, really apologize to all our speakers and panelists for the short amount of time. But we did want to also move towards what can be done about this, and we, how do we find strategies? Because the situation sometimes seems hopeless, but we still have to find some thread, some pathway in order to shift a little bit of what's going on. And I think uh, uh, you did, Shane did a very good job of talking about one of the difficulties in our system of democracy is major majoritarianism. So when you have majoritarianism, how do you ensure that the different communities do not feel under threat? Because when a community feels under threat, it closes in even more and refuses all outsiders. So those are issues that we need to look at. But looking for strategies, I encourage everybody, please do participate in the chat, put in your questions. Uh, please do identify who you are and who the question is for. Or if you just have a comment, you can just leave it there. I'm going to start, so we're moving towards strategy. 
And we're going to uh, look at this by starting with uh, Vrinda Grover, who is a lawyer and an internationally renowned human rights and women's rights activist from India. She is the chair of the board of the International Services for Human Rights, which is based in Geneva, a founder member of the Working Group on Human Rights, uh, India and the UN, and a member of the General Assembly of the OMCT. As a lawyer, she's represented many victims of torture, rape, and extrajudicial killings, helped to draft several bills, which include the draft Prevention of Torture Bill 2010 and the 2013 Criminal Law Amendment to the Law Against Sexual Harassment. She is, has her bachelor's degree in law from Delhi University and her LLM from New York University, better known as NYU. The report, Rinda, recognizes rape as a form of torture. So how do you think this could improve the protection system that we have for women? Thank you, Farida. And first of all, let me really congratulate OMCT, PARA, and all the authors who have actually undertaken this study. Uh, when I read the report, what really struck me was how important it was to look at it across different countries. Uh, and this report, since it spans across Asia, it helps us actually think uh, of, of the issue whether it is of uh, gender-based violence, sexual violence, as well as uh, of the remedies in a broader perspective. And I think by bringing together, and here really, it, I'm, I'm very happy to see that, the, I know that this has been a concern of OMCT and they've been taking this forward repeatedly to bring together uh, violence against women and torture. I think when you join these two, we get a legal prism, which, allows us both to look at the issue differently and gives a very unique legal instrument which, from which we can draw upon the jurisprudence both of torture and violence against women. So let me try and spell out what I mean and why I think this is an important way forward. Across different Asian countries, this report has looked at different aspects of violence against women. Uh, it has, however, found some common recurring themes. As Farida has repeatedly underlined for us that patriarchy and misogyny do lie both at the heart of the cause, as well as any access to justice remedies that women may try and seek against that violence, patriarchy and misogyny continue to be recurring barriers across cultures uh, within Asia, and I'm sure it happens elsewhere too. So how does and and so how does this new uh, additional jurisprudence drawing from uh, the cat jurisprudence and torture uh, help us? It is today understood that there would be any regime would be hard pressed, and I hope uh, this is this remains true. We are in a very uh, different and difficult world as we speak. That torture finds no alibi and torture finds no excuse. In fact, if we recall, even when the US wanted to justify the use of uh, torture in Abu Ghraib, et cetera, it actually said, this is not torture. So torture occupies a certain jurisprudential uh, grund norm, in what we call Hughes Kogans, which no country is going to stand up and say in the Comity of Nations that no, we are, it's okay to use torture. However, when we were to look at the same thing uh, about say even rape or sexual harassment at the workplace that we heard from Cambodia just now of female genital mutilation, there are always multiple and elaborate explanations that are given about how this is part of some kind of culture which and therefore other countries can't interfere with it. Rape of course from an individual rape to uh, uh, mass rapes, there are always uh, multiple versions on justifications that have been presented, unlike what can be presented for torture. And I think therefore bringing it in, taking it out of the silo of women's issues and broad basing it is very, very crucial today, both in taking the issue forward and giving us access to remedies. For instance, the whole issue as has been elaborated upon by Kat and others of due diligence where we know that states, let me speak say for India, 
we know that the state will, will stand up and there'll be much uh, political rhetoric around how they are all committed to ending violence against women. And there's a peculiar phase we use in this country, perhaps it's used across South Asia, zero tolerance for violence against women. But the zero tolerance is not accompanied by any government investment of resources or any actual work that we see on the ground being done by the state. The due diligence principle gives us uh, the ability to actually push the state towards being, towards making those definitive substantive changes as well as being held accountable. One of the reasons the state finds it easy to, uh, to indulge in this political rhetoric is because they can easily lay the blame at the doorstep of individual men who, who can be demonized without the state taking any responsibility for what is happening. And increasingly, at least I can speak confidently about India, women are voting in very large numbers and therefore are the new political constituency that every political party in an electoral democracy wants to uh, 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 capture. At that juncture, to me, there is therefore increased traction of issues of gender-based violence in the political arena without actual commitments and the due diligence principle, not only in the courtroom, but actually in the public sphere, gives us uh, a, a pathway and a route in. Similarly, um, we know that in across uh, uh, South Asia, regardless of how hard uh, everyone has been working in efforts towards making this a rule of law-based society, it is social practices, cultural stereotypes, religious sanctions, which continue to dominate and govern our lives. And in those spaces, to bring in the issue of torture actually gives you an additional platform on which to push this. I would add one more element here, the issue of what constitutes custody. Torture and other international human rights norms have always looked upon custody as custody of state agents or perhaps custody of non-state uh, political or armed actors. How does one begin to look at the domestic sphere as also a custodial sphere is something that feminists have for long been arguing. And I think here there is some work to be done by drawing upon the torture jurisprudence and uh, the gender-based violence jurisprudence to expand upon the nation, notion of what constitutes custody uh, for women when violence is inflicted. Um, I think my time is up. I would only stop by saying uh, that it is through the intersectionality or, and the cross-section of these two jurisprudence that we will be able to compel the state to actually meet its obligations, provide responses, otherwise the state is either going to be uh, uh, only indulging in political rhetoric or taking it to the other extreme of awarding high sentences and death penalty, which does not change the ground reality for most women across the uh, world. I do want to again point out that I think what was particularly effective about this report amongst other things was that the areas that they chose to examine in different countries, for instance, uh, trafficking, uh, uh, migration, uh, forced uh, economic migration on the, on the border of India and Bangladesh, an area of uh, multiple marginalizations and vulnerabilities intersecting with each other, where it's not only uh, the gender of the woman, the ethnicity, being a, perhaps a non-Indian, from a minority religious uh, community, Muslim, being poor, how do all these marginalizations create uh, the, 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 uh, the culture of, imp uh, uh, of impunity and violence, both vis-a-vis -vis state actors and non-state actors? I'll stop there. Thank you. I think uh, uh, I will not repeat because you've done a wonderful job and been very clear about what you're saying. The fact that you can double the jurisprudence that you can call upon. We've already talked about the emotive and, and as uh, Vinda, Vinda said, 
you know, if torture finds no alibi or excuse anywhere. So violence will, there'll be various justifications, but not this. I think the other thing that's important that you said is also that individual men are blamed rather than the system acknowledging that there's a systemic fault here and that we need to address the system rather than an individual. And I think that's something that needs to be explored further. And finally, before I hand over to someone else, I just want to say, you know, for the American or the English saying, put your money where your mouth is. I've been saying for several years now, put your mouth where at least some of your policies are, because there is no state narrative that I hear, which is against violence against women and girls or transgender or other people. There is just nothing. So you pass the law, but you do nothing to bring it alive so that it is more than just uh, something written on paper. So I'm going to ask Shane now, because you've been working on this issue, what are some of the success stories or st successful strategies you've had in taking this forward? Because it's a difficult area, but we have to learn from each other. Shireen? So, with regard to the Muslim personal law reform, uh, not only me, this is a kind of almost 40 years of struggle, the Muslim women's struggle. We have opened up this space for other women to engage in because it's also seen as, uh, particularly in the post-war context, the Muslims have been attacked very heavily. There is a racial attacks on the Muslims, but uh, younger feminists from uh, all all section of the communities are uh, waging a fight for the Muslim girls uh, and uh, raising the minimum age of marriage to 18. There's a private member bill right now in the parliament, but right now we have a political crisis. And also there is a reform uh, that fully en endorsing the, the Muslim women's uh, argument, including abolishing polygamy. It came towards getting approved, but then various other elements hijacked it. Uh, but with regard to female genital mutilation, the previous with the previous government, we were able to at least to recognize that as the cruelty, because Sri Lankan penal code talks about cruelty and degrading treatment. So there was a health circular that was issued to health practitioners to look out look out for female genital mutilation. That's the first time ever in Sri Lanka this has been acknowledged, and there have been studies done. Even the UN. Uh, did the study, but they didn't release it because it looked like attacking the Muslim community because of the context where, that we are in. But we women are actually uh, opening those spaces for them to talk about it because if we don't talk about it, then it will be just uh, as much of the effort put by the women, women's groups will die down and we have to restart everything. And also we have placed this issue in the international uh, agenda. Apart from that, there are various law reforms that have been happening in Sri Lanka, the particularly penal code. Uh, women feminist lawyers have been looking at it and also uh, opening the space for it's not a community issue per se, but it's our women's issues and it's actually uh, torture in that context and also to hold non-state actors accountable. We have been arguing that there should be a commission on violence, an independent commission on violence against women because Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission can only look at state uh, led uh, viola violations of rights uh, or fundamental rights in that way. So we are also within the constitution, we are articulating that violence against women, uh, there should be an independent task force. Um, and also there is a lot of awareness raising and social media activists, there is one of them right now in the, you know, the audience also like there are lots of young Muslim women who are making a big noise about uh, these uh, female genital mutilation and child marriage within the Muslim community, which is being legalized in Sri Lanka, uh, openly on social media. Thanks. Thank you. I think there are certain elements which are part of the women's movement throughout, that you need multiple voices, you need multiple actions. So what you have is the allies and you're working in the parliament, but you're also working on social media. You have different voices, but certainly to not allow the silence to continue and breaking through of that. And I think one of the important things as we go forward would be to look at uh, commissions. Why are non-state actors not part of commissions, not held accountable? That's part of the due diligence of the state. So if the due diligence of the state ensures that you should be looking at this, then all the commissions, et cetera, need to start falling into line and taking that seriously. And I know there's a lot of work being done. So coming to Christina, 
Uh, Christina, I mean, she, uh, the Philippines has a very strong uh, and comprehensive anti-torture law in terms of the definition of what is torture, etc. But this doesn't seem so far to have been applied in the case of gender-based violence against women and girls. So is there a move to do it? And how could that be possible? If you could talk a little about that, that would be great. Thank you, Barida. Um, and I have to be candid here. Having litigated, prosecuted trafficking cases from the time we passed the legislation on anti-trafficking law, uh, the anti-trafficking law in 2003, I have never really honestly looked at trafficking where we see, uh, I, I assess that the women, um, largely women, well, all uh, mostly women who are victims of it, and I've never really viewed it under the lens of um, torture as defined um, in under our anti-torture um, framework. And now having uh, analyzed the case studies, um, which is highlighted in the report, um, I, I see this need to really apply the anti-torture framework, especially when you have cases of trafficking where police, um, law enforcement, as well, including border police, uh, would engage in or would systematically um, inflict um, psychological, uh, severe pain, psychological violence, as well as sexual violence to victims of trafficking. Um, this, this, this really should be looked into in the sense that there has to be some form or some sort of a, a dialogue between um, anti-torture advocates as well as uh, women's rights organization to, to, to work together in ensuring that, um, that, that a holistic approach is applied and that the, the due diligence responsibility of the state be, be invoked failure to do so would really not, not provide justice to what victims suffer when, when there is this systematic infliction of severe pain and suffering to victims of trafficking and, and, and torture. Okay, thank you. So I think the need to not work in silos because that's what's been happening. Even within the women's movement, I often feel even as activists, we also work in silos. So somebody's working on violence, somebody's working on reproductive health, et cetera. We need the broader interconnections here, but also the border law enforcement people. My question to all of you, and perhaps we can think about this, is that I find that most of the so-called gender sensitization modules that have been run with our police and jail officials and other people have no traction whatsoever. And I think that partly this is because somehow the, the, uh, the modules are such that they're too generic and people don't really understand how this impacts them. So maybe that's an area to be uh, thinking about. I mean, that's my experience. It could be different elsewhere. But how do you actually get so not just the advocates working together, but how do you make sure that gender sensitization is really something which has traction? So coming to so people then in Cambodia, you know, um, as you said, it, the women are largely underrepresented in any kind of decision making uh, bodies, right? So whether we're talking about trade unions, workers unions and associations, or if you're talking about political leadership and political parties or the executive branch, uh, branches of the government. So how, what needs to be done uh, to improve? Because what I hear you saying is that you can't really improve the situation unless women are there making the decisions. So how would you go about this? How do we strategize for that? Thank you. I think it's a very um, challenging question uh, because we try to address it for decades, <laughs> for decades. Um, and it, it it have not been improved. Um, I think it re really requires a, a political commitment from all level, um, from the state, from the political party, from the trade unions, um, you know, like the, the, the trade union sector, the NGO sector, and also require the, um, you know, the, the support from the public as a whole. So if we look at the state level um, and the political party level, 
um, we as civil society organization have worked uh, quite hard to um, you know push for a, um, a, a certain affirmative action. For example, having a national policy that put a quota, you know, um, for 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 um, having a certain level of women in in, in certain level. Um, and we have um, advocated a lot with political party when it comes to every uh, electoral mandate. Um, only in this, uh, few, um, you know, the the last mandate in two thousand eighteen and. And, to that, and and now the coming commune council, we have not been work quite, um, you know, uh, uh, um, comprehensively because um, of the political landscape. But in the past, we have um, lobbied a lot with the political party, um, all the political party to have a um, political platform and policy in place um, with the quota system, either sandwich system, and makes makes making sure that they put the women at the top of the political um, of the candidate list. For example, um, it was very hard in this lobbying effort. Um, even you know, with the opposition party, um, sometimes um, when we meet with the political leader, you know what they explain to us. They say that well, you know, their party is upholding the democratic value respecting the human right equality so having affirmative action is you know contradicting to the democratic value <laughs> because you don't uphold the equal opportunity for men and women i find it so problematic when hearing such a comment from a you know political leader who whose party have to pr promote the democratic value <laughs> and respecting the human rights so that is the, the challenge but um, uh, you know, in short, what what I'm trying to say, it really requires a national policy in place to put the um, certain affirmative action, guaranteeing that you know women should be uh, positioned at certain top level, um, and um, also at the uh, civil society level, including the the trade union, for example. You know, there should be a similar model. Otherwise, you know, we would only witness the male in the leadership level in the civil society act, uh, actor as well. Um, and, and, and I think it's, it's really important for the public or the constituency to understand that, you know, like having a woman on board or having equal representation is important. Um, we, we, we mentioned about the underrepresentation within the trade union, for example, and I highlight that around 80% of the um, garment worker are women. But imagine, you know, the, the, the comment I received from certain women, um, uh, women in, the, in, the, uh, in certain level that, that's supposed to be voted, um, uh, you know, for, uh, to, to move up to the leadership level. Uh, uh, ladder, they 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 mentioned that a lot of time, you know, their constituency don't support them. I mean, the women themselves don't support the women because they don't feel trust even in the women capacity, and that is the set true. I mean, I mean, the, the, the set true to the fact that women don't support the women. So that is another side that I feel, you know, um, the public especially the women have to believe in that, you know, having a chain, having somehow a chance for women to take on board can make a difference. And if we want to see the difference, you know, okay. and, and finally, I think for women ourselves, of course, we're talking about the capacity building, blah, blah, blah but I think it, it really requires us to take a, 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 a front step that, you know, we don't wait for others to give the seat to us, you know, we have to claim the seat by ourselves. We, if we wait for any man or any agency to view us, I think it's too long. So claim our place. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. So we have an expression in this part of the world that says rights are not given, they're taken by force. So you have to take your rights. Um, we have two questions. Uh, they are actually for Vrinda, both of them. One is from Lutz Oet, who is the co-director of the Center for Human Rights Law at SOAS. Um, and she is talking about that the gender-based violence against women torture is mainly focused on specific methods, particularly sexual violence and the state requirement. 
which is the involvement of a public official, for example. Um, the discriminatory purpose element has arguably been neglected. So what do you see as the scope and advantages, disadvantages of placing more emphasis on the element of the definition of torture? On the issue of custody, the argument has been put forward that powerlessness is an element of torture. This includes both custody and control, and it should apply to all contents of extreme power imbalances where a person cannot defend themselves. Having said that, there may be some merit in going beyond this element to develop a broader understanding of what constitutes gender-based torture and ill treatment. Um, so a short answer. The second question is from Tachi Lohai, Lohai, sorry, Lohia, who has written the chapter on torture of women in Indonesia uh, in the Indo-Bangladesh border. And uh, the question is, whenever women face any form of violence, it is important to recognize that the violence is gendered and happens specifically because of the identity of the person as a woman. Legally, it is easier to prove that the violence is gendered if it entails sexual violence of any kind. This is also showcased in the Criminal Law Amendment Act of India that addresses specific forms of sexual violence against women. But how do we legally establish that non-sexual violence faced by women, especially the armed forces at the border, is also gendered? I suspect these are long questions, but I would request a short reply. We can continue the discussion. I do want to leave time for the special rapporteur to come in with comments if she wants, and also to close uh, with a fish at the end. So Thanks, go ahead. I've actually attempted to answer Luke's question in the chat in itself. The chat. Okay, great. And, uh, I just want to say two things here. That looks, I totally agree with you that the access of discrimination is critical for us at this juncture. We cannot be talking without looking at the intersectionality, whether due to identity or caste or uh, you know, there could be multiple reasons why the discrimination is taking place. And it, I, in, in my understanding, discrimination is not alien to the torture jurisprudence. Uh, it perhaps definitely needs much more work. And uh, maybe the, the, the uh, conjunction of uh, violence against women and the torture jurisprudence will push this, uh, th this area of thinking further. But it, it will have to have the torture, uh, the, the discrimination um, focus very specifically carved out. I agree with you that custody basically is about powerlessness and we need to go beyond the, the state actor. And that has been a longstanding uh, push from feminist jurisprudence, which has eventually broken the public private divide, but now needs to be pushed further. And that really, I think, are the now, are the ways in which together one can push this. I do uh, therefore take on board both the points. And I think taking torture, uh, um, adding torture to our uh, kitty of issues to work with would actually provide us more legal tools to uh, equip ourselves with. Prachi, thank you very much for writing that uh, chapter. And I agree with you. The it is definite, well, I wouldn't say it's easy to prove uh, sexual violence or any form of gender-based violence, but yes, the law recognizes it or the law codifies it. So that's a beginning, that's a toehold. There are no, there are other gendered ways in which women are targeted, uh, particularly those who live along the border and whose lives are very different. Um, but uh, when there is hostility between nations, um, I am not sure that criminal law is definitely the tool to take those issues forward. I think uh, in my part of the world, we are over invested in criminal law. Uh, for certain kinds of acknowledgement by law, we need to move away. On the issue of torture, we definitely need to dive deep, dive, deep dive into criminal law. But on other aspects, we need to perhaps develop the law of torts so that we can bring to surface the nuances in how, uh, the, what is the gendered impact of that kind of militarization along the border zone without necessarily having to deal with the high threshold of proof beyond reasonable doubt and pinning responsibility and culpability on individual actors. We need to develop the tort law and bring forward these nuances to the court and educate the law. 
Thank you. I'm just going to say one small thing because we've been talking about the law. And my research, the research here in Pakistan, for instance, is that the minority of women, the minority, 37%, ever share any experience of violence with anybody. And this is usually, I mean, verbal is very far. This is just uh, also physical. And of that minority who reports, it is less than 2% who go to any formal institutions. So when we're talking about solutions and how to move forward, we have to also think of the non-legal uh, institutions and arenas because that is where the majority of women go. So Jim, I'm going to move to you and see if you have something to say before we move to Farishta for the last uh, closing remarks from a survivor and see what he has to say. Jim. Yeah, thank you very much, Farida, and thank you to all the uh, panelists. This has been very interesting to follow, and uh, uh, I do agree that um, the link between uh, gender-based uh, violence and torture needs to be explored further. Um, I also think that uh, when it comes to the responsibility of non-state actors, and then uh, the, the definition of responsibility of the state, um, uh, in whose jurisdiction the non-state actor is uh, is acting um, needs to be defined further. And here, for example, I'm thinking in particular about the role, for example, of uh, uh, businesses and private companies. Uh, my mandate is preparing a report uh, this year on violence against indigenous women and girls, for example. And we know there that the uh, activities by extractive industries and, and other uh, industries that exploit the environment is directly linked to uh, increase in gender-based violence in condoning and uh, aiding and abetting uh, actions of gender-based violence that also amount to torture uh, in the environments where they operate. So the question would be there, uh, what is, you know, how, how do we, up, uh, how do we um, force them to uphold uh, their responsibilities and, and to seize these actions? And what does it say about the states to which these uh, countries uh, uh, whose nationality they hold, but also uh, the, the states in whose countries they, they operate. So, so this is, for example, uh, one question. On the issue of custody, I, I wanted just to give an example uh, of a recent sort of uh, communication that, that we issued that doesn't uh, address this issue from the physical custody, uh, precisely uh, point of view, but actually uh, child custody uh, cases. And to cut a very long story short, uh, we had argued that the failure of the Spanish justice system um, to acknowledge uh, that um, a child is being uh, a child uh, is being sexually abused by the father and insisting therefore on granting uh, joint custody to the mother and the father uh, and also uh, forcing the child to uh, be visited by the father uh, amounted uh, first of all to uh, gender-based violence. Uh, also throughout the whole uh, child-centered uh, approach and best interest of the child out of the window, but also that it uh, amounts to torture. And in fact, the special rapporteur on torture had also joined that communication. So this is an example uh, of uh, perhaps a non-physical custody issue and the way it relates to GBV and torture. Thank you so much. Um, so we have just two minutes left. I'm going to give them to Fresh Star Survivor. Krista, have you, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm if here. there's something you can give us, what is the hope? You're such a marvelous activist. You survived all this um, and you're fighting still. So yeah. where thank is the so hope? Much. Thank you so much for Farida and thank you so much for having me here today. And let me share my experience. Thank you, OEM City for, uh, thanks to OEM City for putting the great works and effort. Yes, we the women have been through a lot throughout the history, but the history also proved that uh, whenever there's a resilience, there's a victory. Um, it has been nine months since the since a terrorist group took over my country. All the, our rights, all our um, achievements uh, throughout that we achieved through lots of years. Um, perished in one night, but, um, and also I have been in various meetings, conferences, workshops, refugee camps, universities and schools, and the more I speak and work about um, for the human rights, the more I realize that women's rights is the um, highest priority, um, especially for my country, for Afghanistan, at the particular moment. Um, and the key to ensure human rights uh, is sustainable is 
playing an active role by international community. Yes, there are millions of people and women screaming and um, urging us uh, and they want us to stand for them because we have the freedom to do so. Uh, it will take a sincere effort. It will take, it will require lots of efforts, uh, but um, let's not forget that there were days that women didn't have the right to, to vote. Uh, they stand it for us women from previous generations. We have to stand for our next generations. Um, let's not hope, let's not um, uh, uh, lose hope. Let's work for them and let's stand for women. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fish. I'd like to thank all of the wonderful panelists for their contributions and their ideas um, and for everyone being here and participating in this. Um, uh, we will leave it at that with we'll finish this saying resilience is victory. So every small victory we can mark, let's celebrate that while we continue to struggle. And I think we've, it's clear that we need to use all the forums that are available from the grassroots, from the homes, right up to the international level. And I do think it is time that we make gender-based torture the slogan for gender-based violence against women, girls, and others. Because as we said, I think this opens a new possibility. Hopefully we can leverage greater change with this because there is such a emotive response to torture. Uh, and it's clearly you can't be excusing torture, whatever else you're excusing. So thank you everyone. And we wish you a pleasant rest of the evening or day, wherever you are. Thank you, back to the organizers. Uh, Nicole, is there anything that you would like to add? When is this going to be available for people to hear, listen to afterwards? Um, yes, indeed, we've recorded it and um, we'll uh, want to make it available um, to, for others to listen as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.